Okay, great. Awesome. We are ready to go. Um, so this is my presentation on Rembrandt's The Toilet of Bathsheba. Um, I wrote a paper about this in college in a class that really inspired my love of um, art conservation and how it fuses together the material and the creation of, of paintings and other all kinds of work, but we mostly looked at paintings. Um, and then the history and how that relates to us in the current day. So there's this kind of these layers when we look at a painting and how we perceive it, what literally like what we're looking at, and especially if you're in a museum, like how it's been conserved, how it's lit, how it's presented. Um, but then also how it ties to us and the artist and the, all the different people who have had a say in this painting um, together. And that's also, of course, the, the models and the people that are shown in this work. So there's, there's kind of, uh, I'm kind of trying to take a three-pronged approach to this painting where I'll be going over the um the visual elements and then um uh, go a bit into the history um and the conservation because you know a little bit about what happened to this painting and why it looks the way it does uh, so i have currently let's see a little so this is this is the painting it's the toilet of Bathsheba by rembrandt van Rye. um and I have, I have more screenshots of closer up. This painting is rather small. Um, I think it's about like probably no larger than two feet on all sides, um, even smaller than that. I, I have the dimensions listed. Um, and I saw it in the Met um, at a show of Dutch masters. And it just captured me because of the, the way that Rembrandt is using light. Um, and specifically using, you know, the Bathsheba is this like central figure and everyone around her is kind of contributing to her light. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously that also, there's the, the, the maid who in the back who's cleaning her hair is also kind of part of that structure that contributes to this, this, the, the way that Rembrandt is rendering light and rendering Bathsheba. Um, and there's a lot of conversation about the story that inspired this painting, um, the biblical story about King David. He sees Bathsheba bathing um, from a tower and he's looking at her and he's watching her. So there's this, also this element of like the desire for her and how he ends up trapping his, her husband into, not trapping him, but like coercing him to go to go to war and, and hoping that he would have sex with her so that he could, there's, there's kind of like a mystery about her child. Hello. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of this kind of, but there's a, the, the woman who's at the center of the story is, is a nude that, um, is really commonly depicted. Bathsheba, King David's gaze on Bathsheba is is a one of the kind of few like female nudes that are biblical stories that we can kind of point at that have this really intense gaze on the female figure that isn't just like that is like he wants her. It's very obvious, um, and obviously Rembrandt is putting that into this painting as well and constructing all the other elements and figures around it to highlight her and that, and King um, David's desire. He's technically in the painting. In theory, there's a small little se segment here, which you can't see, that, that is like a little tiny bump on this like tower that is kind of implied to be him watching her. But it's not about that. It's about this kind of, this gaze. Um, it's not about him necessarily. Um, and so I have a lot of kind of close up cross that I'll go be going back to about of, of this painting. And um, 
um, Hello. and um, how Rembrandt is kind of constructing the painting. So I'll be going through these all at the beginning just because I didn't know when I would need to go back to them. Um, and so, yeah, I'll be flipping through back and forth just to kind of get to the specific ones I want to look at. But this one is Bathsheba's face um, and just taking, you know, I, I really want everyone to think about like how he's rendering her and rendering light. Um, and then uh, this is her second maid who is cleaning her feet and how she's, her face is rendered and how she looks. Um, and even like their little details, like the light on the edge of her glasses, which is also really an interesting thing. I could go on about the history of going to this. <laughs> they weren't that common back in the day. So it's also a really interesting um, thing to talk about, but, could, but save for another day. This is me, we'll be starting me rambling about history. Um, and, and just like, but the way that she's rendered is still very, despite this painting is not big. So this is a really small face and he's still able to kind of pull out these details and really make um, a lot out of such a small, um, small segment of painting. Um, and then this is the maid that's behind her that's combing her hair. And it's the only black figure um, in the painting. And it's why I wanted to, paint, to talk about this painting. It's what, what caught my eye. Um, I'd had actually been in the gallery and I was looking at a female painter and I was wanting to talk about, you know, the female gaze was one of the things I was thinking about writing this paper about. And I ended up not going with that painting, not to say that that's not an interesting subject at all. It, it extremely is. Um, but there was just something about how stark the differences are between how these char these characters and these figures are are rendered and how her you know we don't see many black figures in early modern painting at all it's it's something that i i've kind of had a bit of a like obsession with um so i i was like i need to kind of take a deeper look at this one and spend a long time looking at this painting and understanding this painting um or trying to i i don't really come to many conclusions necessarily but i do kind of hope you guys can uh, kind of uncover more alongside me about this painting and what it means and how we kind of how i want to look at it um and the history of it of course um and so this is this is the light and on the maid and on her arm and just the kind of the attention to detail that's being placed on even the smallest parts of her body. Um, and yeah, this is Bathsheba's shoulder where you can see she's like glowing. Even her skin is lighter than the the like shining bangle and, and the light that's a lot like on top of her body. Um, and this is a, this is Rembrandt's signature um and this is also the edge of the painting it's painted on wood there's a little side note about this wood as well that i'll, I'll go into um if we have time um i think it's just an, it kind of ties things together and this is kind of just another a crop to show the contrast between how dark i mean this is also just how baroque era painting was like light was really really important darkness was um you know, the depths of the darkest darks were were really um, muddy and, and deep, but still had detail. So there, it's hard to see, but there is detail in all the, this, this surrounding area. Um, but Bathsheba's body is just like unbelievably light. Um, and here's one more crop. I couldn't give, I couldn't resist. I just kept her making drops of this painting. There's so many things to talk about. And I, I, I didn't even make slides or anything, so I was just like, I'm gonna be able to freestyle on a lot of these things. But uh, the this is like a beam of light, and the way the thickness of it is just unbelievable. The way that it's almost carved like out the darkness around this um, peacock, and the the way that the light just kind of like sticks, and it's it's there. 
Um, and it kind of shows what, how Rembrandt painted. But I'll talk a bit about how he developed his paints um, and how the viscosity, thickness, and the things that he added to his paints were tailor-made to every element of the painting. And he had multiple different palettes that he would work from to do so. Um, there's a, I'll, there's a, I'll play a clip of, of the documentary that kind of gave more information about that, which I, I think would be a, a fun watch. It's a, rather, a little long, but I, I clipped the end. So I think that'll be nice. Um, so the painting is the Toilet of Bathsheba, Rem, obviously painted by Rembrandt van Rijn um, in 1643, which is just kind of the center of the, that this kind of like early modern period, which is, um, it's, I think when we say like Renaissance, it's not always as accurate as it could be. And I, for me, I like to specify early modern period because the modern period begins with the first kind of like contact um, with um, South America, the Americas, and then also not the first contact with Africa, but with this kind of beginning of the colonial trade. And it's why there's so much wealth in Europe at the time and why the things that the ideas that were kind of are considered like enlightenment ideas were able to be enacted and flourish at that time. Because those ideas were not new, but they were being kind of, um, they were able to be funded things like, I mean, there's a lot of other things we could talk about. Welcome, welcome. Also, if there's not enough seats, please pull up a chair. I didn't know how many people would come, so I kind of just maybe I went off skimped on the chairs. <laughs> um, oh, and I could you just well, I'll go, I'll go back to these these things. Um, and um, yeah, it's twenty two. Uh, oh, early modern period. We'll talk more about the history, um, but it is the slave trade is a big part of that and the colonial. Um, especially talk specifically, like you go in more in depth, I, I try not to go too far into the art history and just the history of history, but um, about specifically the Netherlands um, and their kind of role, even though they weren't owning slaves, um, as like, they weren't as involved in the slave trade as specifically their imperial kind of reach was really powerful. And it's also why they were, you know, the they have this kind of golden age of Dutch painting, which comes about in Rembrandt's time. Um, so there's a lot of like wealth centered in, in Europe because of this world. And so Rembrandt flourished in that environment. Uh, and he was able to make lots and lots of, of paintings have lots of investors and obviously that kind of space um, is why we have so much of his work today. Um, I'm just going to go back real quick so everyone can see because I know we've had some latecomers. Um, this is the painting. This is the Toilet of Bathsheba. Um, and so yeah it's a, it's a small painting so it's 22 by 30. Um, so it is a, a little bit over two feet. Um, and it depicts this biblical story. Um, it's, it has a lot of conversations about gaze and about light and about highlighting who these people are, who these women are and who is looking at them. Um, and so what I wanted to go into initially, and that's kind of the origins of this, the course I was taking, was it the one who taught it was a conservator? She's a painting conservator, um, and so a big portion was me looking at the painting and just understanding how it was made, understanding the layers that vi visibly went into it, and how he created this painting. So, without I obviously I uh, I'll show you we have research and into into how he made his paintings, but I obviously didn't you know. There's not like a study, there was not like study on this specific one. So there's a lot of these things are me kind of taking the research we do know and extrapolating on it. Um, and it's a it's a piece on, um, it's painted on wood. Um, and the wood has been treated and it's really smooth. 
It's a really, really glossy, smooth painting. Um, and the it's interesting because it's it's glossy, but there you can tell that there's a lot of variety of thicknesses and and layers that go into the textures here. Um, like this one because you can kind of see where there's um almost just like gentle brushes of light that almost just retain all of the brush strokes without much blending um and then here where it's really really just going in and putting it right on um so we have a lot of variety in this painting, a lot of textural variety, despite the painting surface itself being really smooth. Um, and the surface, I did find out that Rembrandt's studio was known to take wood from the docks in Amsterdam and use them for their paintings on wood, which all, almost, it's not verified or anything, but could have been very likely from that, this triangle trade of, of, of this colonial transatlantic slave trade. So there's this kind of tie into the wood as well that the painting is on. We don't know what it is, but it, it very well could be um, wood from that kind of whole industri industry itself, which is really interesting. And it's why this kind of figure is also part, she's part of that slave trade as well. Um, and it is one of the few that Rembrandt depicts a woman of color uh, was one of the things that I thought was really interesting. I didn't, I haven't like seen at all of Rembrandt's work, but this is the only one I've ever, ever seen it in my research, only one I ever found that, that has a woman of color in it. So it's something that he clearly like wanted to, to mean something, um, or at least he was trying to reflect his reality um, as a, man living in the 1600s where slavery and you know black slaves were something that you would see if you were in an upper class you know culture you would see people who who had slaves that they had bought from uh, from the street um and so yeah there's there's a lot here i know i'm kind of just a lot of it's just me kind of talking um, <laughs> about the painting, um, but I kind of pointed these things out already. They're the, the interesting thing that I also wanted to talk about with the paint, which we'll talk a bit more, is that the, it's, let me actually get to the one that's closer to her face. There's kind of this underpainting almost peeking through. Her face is rendered in such low detail that it's near impossible to say that this isn't, the, 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 the painting itself was cleaned uh, aggressively. And I mean, I just, I just, one of my arguments is that I don't think that Rembrandt painted this way. Like, I don't think that he painted this woman in with, without, with, with the lack of, um, kind of care that he was putting into even the other parts of her body of like the lighting that's that's here and so this mm -hmm. this painting has been cleaned the Met does talk about it I have a slide about that as well um and that over cleaning is um kind of does a disservice to us as the viewer to the to I'm assuming his the model that he brought in I doubt he I just had someone, you know, made up, made up a black woman. He had a model sit for him. He definitely had a model sit for Bathsheba. And there's there's a whole controversy about specifically this little line right here on her leg. Um, because she, you could tell at that in that time period, people tied their garters to their legs. You could tell that she was had worn garters, and that was kind of too much reality for a lot of um uh people when this painting was created it was kind of you know it was all of a sudden there's the conflict between the real um and how women actually looked and what women's lives were like at, in, in 1640 and this idealized biblical figure but the interesting thing is that this this maid isn't something that was considered she wasn't considered um unrealistic 
which I find interesting to me, or at least it wasn't something that was being talked about. And maybe that is just because race wasn't a conversation that people were having, but it was extremely apparent <laughs> in that time. But um, there's there's something here, and I wanted to kind of talk about that. And um, she is also a product of Rembrandt's reality, of Rembrandt's time. Um, uh, obviously, I, I'm assuming, you know, we could do a lot of research and figure out, you know, what time period Bathsheba stories would be set in and where in in the Middle East this would have occurred and, and what kind of slave trade was happening there. And and maybe you could say that, you know, that she might have also had black slaves as well. But that it's not really something that we can ever verify because it's a story. But Rembrandt was real. Um, and we know about his culture. Um, and so one of the things I'm, I'm actually going to skip a little bit of it because I think I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> but I, I the, the one of the things that I'm kind of coming to this with is thinking about the players in this story, the culture and the cultures that they're coming from. So the Rembrandt, the artist, what is his lens? How is he seeing the story, the characters and the world that he lives in? The patron who commissioned him. We don't know it that much about this person. Um, I think I can, from what the provenance says, um, I could figure out his name, but um, I don't. It wasn't. He wasn't. I wasn't able to figure out anything else about this guy. And um, additionally, also that we don't. We don't know very much about the conservator who cleaned this work. That it has been cleaned. It's it's verified by the method it was over over cleaned aggressively, uh, aggressively so. Um, but then also additionally, I think that's code for Judy. Oh, it's Bathsheba. It's what? Bathsheba. It's on the it's on the web page as well. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and then the conservator who cleaned the work, we don't know very much about them. And also you. Um, I think the viewer is almost just as important to the art that we're looking at that and how we understand it, of course. I mean, it, we're understanding things in our own minds, but our culture and who, how we talk about things and what we see, um, it's also really important. And the patron also kind of stands in uh, as well, this concept of, of, of the culture that saw these, this work as well, because this was also, this was shown, people talked about it um, um, at the time. Um, and so that's kind of these layers, the layers that I'm looking at this with. Um, and, um, I do want to talk a little bit more about the paint itself, because I think that's also, this is kind of unlocking why this painting was overly cleaned and maybe also even why the aggressive nature specifically on the black maid's face was so, um, egregious, um, was that Rembrandt is, oops. It was known to kind of um, make a lot of different blends for for the different tones and um, light and all these things that he was painting. Like he had various palettes for every element in his paintings. Um, and this documented Rembrandt in his paints kind of goes really in depth into this a specific um understanding about him and it wasn't something that we knew until the research by um gosh I don't his name um and Spender Vasering um he's kind of the lead scholar on Rembrandt um at that time and and still is really influential in how we understand how we conserve his art his work specifically because it, the way that he operated it is really unique to him. Um, so I'm gonna play a little clip um, about Rembrandt and about how he made his paints. This documentary, Rembrandt and his paints, really cool stuff. There's the whole things on YouTube for free. So if you guys would like to check this out, I think it would be good. Um, the students got a good impression of the workability of the type of paint that was used in the 17th century. Professor of Pondering, 
advise the student how best to apply the paint using a brush or a mace. The study carried out by the Rembrandt Research Project in cooperation with DSM Research has yielded a wealth of new information. All of the factors that may have had an influence on the properties of Rembrandt's paint have now been identified and classified. The main conclusion to emerge from this research is that the properties of Rembrandt's paint were not only determined by the binder, but to a greater extent than was hitherto consumed, also by the particle size of the pigment and by any fillers present. Some of the discoveries made in this project have contributed greatly to our understanding of Rembrandt's working methods. For example, the discovery that Rembrandt composed his paintings in stages using different ballots is a major step forward in the unraveling of the mystery surrounding Rembrandt's art. So, yeah, there's a lot that we didn't know until this research um, about how Rembrandt um, created his paints. He made, he, they go in, they actually recreate in this documentary almost to the letter what they can, bear, they think his paints were like and how, what additives he added. He's, there's a lot of kind of these different things. And so sometimes I, and I don't want to like give credence to someone who maybe was, you know, implicit bias was involved in the way that they treated this painting. But there is also this kind of question of perhaps they just didn't know Rembrandt and they didn't understand his paintings as well as they could have. And that led them to a even more aggressive. I mean, I'm clearly someone was aggressive. This is not, this is ridiculous. <laughs> but um, that, that this, the way that Rembrandt developed specifically the paint for the tone of this um, figure of, of, of this black maid, I think that her skin tone was developed differently than, than any other character or, or figure that Rembrandt had painted and perhaps this conservator didn't understand. And I think that's just, you know, something that I personally, as a someone who's interested in conservation, think is we need to do better is to understand when, and as painters too, to understand that that people and their skin is something that's more than just a color, but it, it is an intrinsic way that we create um, the the worlds that we are we're painting and the and the characters that we're painting and and what that represents. So I, I think that might also be, you know, a reason why this painting is so stark in in how Bathsheba, her the loving way, you know, these this those little lines of, of hair and the 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 light shade to her chin and all these different tones and textures in her and her other maid's face, whereas, you know, the the flat, you know, oh, overly um, clean and, and, and depersonalized nature um, kind of comes about um, from the way that this painting was treated. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of talk a bit more here um, about the, the transatlantic slave trade and the culture that comes through in this, that the that we the colonialism isn't something that we can um, kind of extract ourselves from easily. It's not something that like this trade that led um, this maid to be here, Rembrandt to be able to paint her, Rembrandt to make his living as a painter, and then the bias from that the, the that legacy of colonialism that leads this conservator to treat her badly as a conservator. And, and then, you know, all the way to us in 2024, now having to grapple with our understandings of, of race, of painting, of the early modern period of colonialism and, and how those kind of intersections are something that I think is the only, like, Understanding the fullness 
is the only way we can do justice to her. And, you know, we don't even know, no idea who she is, of course. And, and we don't have no idea what her legacy was. But, you know, that doesn't matter necessarily because we we need to like look to the future and how we how we move through the world as artists and how we move through the world as consumers of of all kinds of media but lovers of painting you know and and creators of of our own art um and and also kind of to reject the kind of that is just how the way it was because that's just how the way it was was the reason why no one researched you know, maybe didn't didn't do as much research into this. Why? Why? Oh my God! All the you know, all the pain is coming off when I'm cleaning this woman's face, or you know the 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 reason why people pass by this painting and don't sometimes don't even notice the the figure in the background. Um, and this is something that we see a lot in the way that we paint black figures and see black figures and um museums is that sometimes it's you have to take a second look and you have to take a second thought on on how that um that you know the, the world that these paintings are coming out of and how we can kind of counter that in our own lives um so yeah um this is a bit more about the conservation i kind of made my slides out of order <laughs> oops um but this is this is where you know the this is the wall text is that that says that this picture was badly abraded, specifically the the black attendant and and these questions of um why and how you know we see we see blackness um so yeah that this is I wanted to also open it up for this conversation I don't want just to kind of leave everyone with all this information because there's not really like a total way that we can just like understand this but I want I want to kind of hear everyone as artists and and their ideas about these things um and highly recommend checking out you know um the the documentary and other uh, the other research that kind of went into this because really really there's far more than we're at I just kind of been like scraping the surface for just a few things and I wanted to kind of make sure that we all know that there's there's far more research out there. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know if anyone has. Um, so I don't know much about like the process of conservation, but why when they were like removing the paint from the face, like why didn't they stop when they realized that? There's a lot. There's a lot going on there. Um, so there, I I obviously don't know the full story, of course, but when obviously you varnish a painting there's lots of layers of varnish and those varnish layers change color and they're also made out of different materials so um when conservators clean paintings they're not just like clean cleaning it they're removing old layers of varnish and depending on the paints that are lying under that the what you're using to remove that varnish can be degrading the paint underneath and most conservators nowadays um, have the, you know, ability to do uh, like electromagnetic or what's it called? The test, test the paints beforehand. Um, and I don't, obviously I don't know anything about the actual conservation of that and that specific occurrence just wasn't something that I was able to find out. Um, but, you know, yeah, this person probably was the, there's a lot. There's a lot there. I don't know. Maybe they also just said like, this is too dark. This is, this, this must be extra. This must be browned, brown varnish. And, and I'm just going to keep on removing. And I mean, there's lots of paintings that have been overly, over cleaned. Um, and there's, you know, it, it's something that was, people were very aggressive in the kind of early era of conservation. Yes. And was it cleaned? We don't know. Um, it's I kind of scoured the Met is the the people who would actually probably have far more information. But I went on to their like they have like a list of like the provenance of the painting and stuff, and when it was acquired by the Met. And they're actually I can pull this up. There's actually a I know at least it wasn't early. I mean they didn't really clean paintings back in the day, but there is a 
Um, let me just actually see if I can pull this up. Um, there's also, so what I'm going to show here is, oh, and my mom's raising her hand. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a print made of this painting. Um, and the print has more detail of her face than, than the painting itself. So it it's, should be recent. Um, let me stop the slideshow and let me see if I can pull just this in so you can see this is from my <laughs> this is my essay I wrote um, but I, I don't know how to pull the print exactly I forgot to put it into the slide but you can kind of see um, here there's there's actually a good amount of shading and detail and this print was um I thought I had a list of them but it might be later on um but it was it, it it's definitely um it was made not not so far after the painting was created. So there's definitely some some time in a kind of more recent era, something went wrong. And the Met acquired this painting, I think in 1912, um, I'm pretty sure, um, 1913. Um, so that also could have been the Met, we don't know. Um, my, my mom is raising her hand and I wanna give her a chance to speak um, if I can get my, um, hey, mom. hey mommy can you hear me yes <laughs> actually can you go back to the drawing the it's, uh, it's the, uh, the one that you show the yeah this one. um because it's related to my question so i i thought your argument was really compelling and um uh i learned a lot but i wonder if there's one other way to think about it and i wonder what you think about this which would be what if Rembrandt was um, in his depictions producing a racist imaginary of whose face is important. So let's say yeah. that we know that it's been cleaned up and made worse than what it was. Yeah. But maybe it was already. It might not have already been great. <laughs> exactly. And, you yeah. know, maybe we'll never know that, but, you know, that he himself may not have given the same level of attention to her face that he gave to her arm or, you know, to the other women's faces. And I don't know that you'll ever know, but I do feel like that that's why I was interested in this drawing because- It's a bit of a key to kind of unlocking a little bit more. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, just thinking of her as background, you know, as brown as the brown, behind her and not humanizing her fully you know with a detailed face so what do you think about that I think that's also very compelling and I think there's there's a that is an alternate way to understand I want to be able to get my mouse okay cool. I'm gonna see if I can pull this up in bigger in a bigger more high quality because it's on the mess website um um and I think you know there that is an alternative is that also his culture was racist too I I've written about um for a separate course about specifically comparing these kind of the so it was about prints specifically but it was a, a, about these kind of dip, early depictions of african and um native american or, and native and to the americas people in this these first contacts with europeans and the way that those there is this kind of dual imaginings there's kind of the 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 stereotyped very elaborate almost cartoonish imagery that we see and then there's um this other this this is a different paper that I wrote but this the, there's another kind of imagery that we also had saw a lot of which was very realistic but it was kind of applying a European um like understanding of how faces look and understanding about how bodies look um, to these figures. So there's these kind of like, they're not, not neither of them are accurate, but you know, one is kind of just like superseding, like placing blackness on top of whiteness. And one is creating blackness as a, as a, as a trope or as a, you know, vehicle for some kind of other message that actually has nothing to do with the people themselves, of course. So there's there is a there is a a history for that kind of 
um, caricature and understanding of, of um, Black figures in art and in that time period specifically. So that is, a, that is another way to, to see it. I just felt for me that I was so enamored by the way that she was rendered in the other parts of her, um, here we go, we do have it on the Mets website. Great, so you guys can kind of get a higher quality view of this. Um, that um, you can kind of see her face a little, ooh, a little bit better. <laughs> this is why I put all these screen tests, but not get it to zoom properly. Um, you can kind of get a little bit more. There's there's just more detail. Like she has, um, you know, there's there's more light. There's more, um, uh, like even the, this this head covering, and obviously this is again like a a print of a painting. So clearly someone is interpreting again. There's another figure in this line of people that we have to understand to unlock this image. But um, I do think I, that's kind of where I was coming at it was that I was like, well, I, I can't believe that Rembrandt would just have a caricature sitting in the in the middle of his um, his otherwise lovingly rendered painting. Not to say that Rembrandt wasn't racist, but just that Rembrandt wasn't a person who used that as a way to express his ideas. And I don't know anything about him. So, of course, it's. I mean, obviously he didn't depict black people very often, but that was kind of the mode of the time as well. And I wonder, I think, I think I'm thinking more about how he's using her as an object in some ways to highlight Bathsheba rather than using her as a um, propaganda piece for, for uh, the kind of continued devaluation of black face and black image. Um, so she's kind of more, I mean, that's how maids kind of characteristically were at this time, were used as objects to kind of highlight their, the, the, a lot of times there's like a, there's a nude line, there's actually also a maid in the background, there's another woman in the painting that you don't see initially, and that's kind of this, there's a, there's a history of that, um, but yeah, yeah, I would love to, I just want to know everyone's ideas, because this is something that is, I'd like to talk about. <laughs> Yes. I'm curious, like, I know that some conservators, um, and it, it depends a lot on the, um, whoever is, you know, the patron of the conservation as well, like, it's a right their decision, but I know that some conservators will, if a painting has been overcleaned or there's areas um, of paint loss that they will you know, with all the research in paint, yeah. they will paint yeah. to the best of their abilities to render that figure yeah. to, you know, try to represent what it originally looked like. And I'm curious at the at the Met's decision to keep the figure yeah. with the lost paint, if that was like a decision to show the history of the yeah. conservation process, which is also something that sometimes happens. Um, or if there was just too much loss, or if that's, you know, another continued legacy of this, you know, kind of racist perspective. This is, this is a big ethical question mm -hmm. in conservation. Yeah, almost every country that has a, like, robust paintings and other kinds of art, but, you know, this is a big question of painting, uh, conservation, like, culture or education, um, has their own ideas about how this goes. Um, and, and then obviously individually, each museum has their own way of uh, uh, dealing with this. And there's always the outside conservators who work independently, but in painting is something that is a, a big deal and, and very controversial. Some people kind of see it as a, more like a Theseus's ship type problem where if you continue to, to replace these, these chipped or broken or or uh, over cleaned sections of the paintings, eventually we end up at the end with nothing of the original artist left. Some people have a percentage that they deem appropriate of how much can be re re renewed or re and painted. Um, and some places are very much against even trying to, you know, to touch it. There's people who obviously want it all looking beautiful and good as well. Uh, 
Um, and I think the Met is um, when of the paintings that I saw at the Met, we actually talked about another one that was older, but that was deliberately not cleaned. Um, and for, I think that there was a couple other reasons of why, but it was about paint and stability. And, and there was also just the varnish was yellow, but it wasn't so super bad. Um, and so there, I think the method are a little bit more conservative on the, the idea of in painting, but it's definitely something that is, it, yeah, it is like, again, like how do we write a wrong in conservation as in like how we write this person's mistake at, at their job or you know doing something that we don't approve of today because conservation has grown as a field and changed really drastically in the last 100 years people don't do things the way they did even 20 to 30 years ago and the materials that are being used now are, are much more likely to be um, reversible or non-destructive as much as we can tell but obviously like in 20 years from now that'll they'll probably look back and be like stuff they were doing in the 2020s really was wasn't it <laughs> so um yeah it's there's a ethics of conservation is something that I'm actually rather interested in and I think it kind of ties into this talk um and I don't know I don't know I want to know more and I kind of want to bring up more of these questions and under cheer people's understandings of those ideas because I'm not a trained conservator I'm just hopeful future conservator uh you know and there may be a lot of reasons why the an in painting didn't occur onto this one specifically um or even if that would be considered the right way to re you know reverse this this loss uh, yeah yeah um i think we're almost we've actually got like i, I just kind of sped through this <laughs> we we have a little bit of time i think it's an hour long right 1 30 to 12 30 um, we can look at the painting a little bit more if we'd like. Um, um, and just kind of, I don't know. I just like looking at it. It's a pretty one. I really, I really enjoy um, just the way that the light was, is rendered. And, and again, like that kind of thesis of Rembrandt's painting is that, you know, she is the light. She is the gaze. She is, you're drawn to her. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of kind of ideas about what was happening underneath where she probably, he probably did a, she, he probably, you know, did a, well, we can actually see that there was definitely a wash, um, or you know, kind of see down here, there's, there's this like brown, um, on un underpainting or, or kind of initial layer. And then, um, um, as you kind of, as he build, builds this painting up in sections, he clearly put a really, really opaque layer down to block out uh, Bathsheba's body. She's, she's, she's done in these really beautiful layers where you can kind of like see the gentle kind of rushes of, of light on her body and rushes of shadow. So clearly like this wasn't just like him putting the you know final strokes right on top. He was not. I think it's called direct painting. Is when it's all wet. This is clearly um, a more of a different style. Um, but he also he's he's he works in different ways at different times of his life too. So um, I could you know you could probably go into more. The some of the some of the um, uh, one of the things I cited is a is by Ernst van der Weijering, and he's a, kind of the premier Rembrandt scholar, specifically in the realm of conservation. And talks more about like understanding all these different methods of how he was working, um, and how he worked into his paintings, uh, and also what he taught at school. What his not all of this is him. Not all is Rembrandt. There's a little asterisk. He also had a, had a school of students similar to the ateliers that would also help on his paintings, um, and some of them, you know. He he maybe they would mix his paints for him. I don't know how much actual involvement they had in the you know end result, but um there's there's kind of a um uh, you know it's a little bit of a mystery of exactly where the those lines are drawn. But when you say Rembrandt, you also are talking about their uncredited labor that is going into this as well. That that you know some of them maybe have, did become 
you know, painters uh, of their own right that had, you know, their names respected, but some of the, many of them didn't and were never really known to history. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I love, I love this kind of stuff. This is, this is what gets me jazzed up. I like getting to pull these things apart and analyze every little element and and see this like thread that's running through. Sometimes the thread isn't racism. I <laughs> just FYI, like I also love other kinds of things, but the the stuff that really excites me is I do have a lot of knowledge about colonialism and um I took a lot of courses in college about um, the Renaissance, early modern period um and like colonialism and, and art history so those are this is where my strengths lie is getting to kind of pull those things apart um and would love to see you know more of that in in people talking about conservation and, and how they they treat their the works that they 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 deal with um so yeah i think we're gonna we're gonna end thank you everybody thank you guys <laughs> i i had a lot of fun um and, you know, if you ever just want to talk about art with me, I'll just blab forever and ever and ever. So this was kind of an excuse. <laughs> um, let me see how I can turn off the recording. Um,